my take on this um, is pretty simple. We have a massive responsibility as uh, technologists in this industry to build a future, but just who are we building this connected future for? Um, why are we building this connected future? So I just want to take a quick census, actually. Who in this audience here, just raise your hands if you have children. Okay, keep your hands raised just now. Um, actually, who, who has children, uh, or keep your hands raised if you have children between the ages of five and 10? Okay, now keep your hands raised if you've actually spoken to your children about what you do as a living and whether you've asked them what they want you to build for the future. And there's about five. Okay, so we've got a lot of work to do. Um, so one of the things I like to open up with is um, a simple healthcare example, a connected healthcare example that um, I like to sort of paint for the future. Imagine if you fall ill um, in the future, the, the chances are that you'll be diagnosed by an AI doctor rather than a physical doctor. You won't need to go to a, a, a GP office. You will be diagnosed by someone, smart device in your home that you can talk to and tell them your ailments. That information is going to be passed to a connected hospital, for example, in real time, where it'll be fact-checked by um, an actual surgeon who will check over the data, probably schedule something in for you to come in, say you've fallen, you've hurt your hip, you need to come in for a hip operation. The chances are that any bones or any organs in the future will actually be 3D printed in situ, um, personalized to you because they have all the information at hand uh, according to your medical records. They've done scans, so they know exactly your, your dimensions. They will print these uh, bones with 3D sensors, uh, with sensors, um, IoT connected sensors, um, which will relay information in real time post post-surgery. Um, the surgery itself will be performed by robots. Um, I've actually read a report la uh, late last year where there was a neurosurgeon, um, they compared neurosurgery with a robot to a neurosurgery with a human. Human took about two and a half hours to do new neurosurgery and a robot took two and a half minutes to do the same, um, perform the same uh, task. So in the future, you'll be uh, attended to by robots, supervised by people. Um, you'll no doubt go to and from the hospital in uh, a connected vehicle, uh, an autonomous vehicle. You'll be looked after at home, convalescing um, by taken care of by a robot. All that information will be passed in real time to your GP, who will be able to adjust your convalescent period, your recovery, the method, medicines used, all in real time according to national norms, for example. And everything that's connected in your home will be adjusted in real time as well, probably by smart contracts, um, because the, the home will know that you're convalescing, so that will relay that information to the grid. Your uh, insurance plans, your utility bills will all be adjusted accordingly. And this is all supposed to lead us to a better life. But the problem is, is that the more that we connect industries, not just things and people, we are talking about industries. There are several industries at play here when you think, when you think about it. It's pharmaceuticals, connected vehicles, um, hospitals, electricity grids, utilities, robotics, AI, all these different kinds of industries are connected. And this is what we're building. But the trouble is, is that we're, the more that we connect, the more people that we're actually removing from this. So if you actually look at this diagram here, there are only three instances where people are actually involved in this process. So you have the guy who's just uh, the surgeon who spent years um, studying medicine, who's now actually just been reduced to fact checking what AI has actually predicted. In this instance here, you've actually got the surgeon who spent years again uh, perfecting his art and his craft who's now reduced to babysitting a robot who actually does uh, the surgery itself. And the last instance, well, she's the patient, so that doesn't really count. So we're building systems, but we're actually removing people from the equation. And another great example of that is the, um, the transition of jobs over the years, the most popular job in the United States. Um, back then, it was very sort of manual, uh, manual work, farming, secretarial work, machine operating. Um, as the years roll forward, you find that we automate and connect more machines. That removes people from that. And people start to move towards jobs that they feel safe with. 
So we connect machines and we start to see, well, actually, truck driving, for example, is now going to be the most popular because it feels safer. I see farming being automated. So that's no longer a, a task that humans can perform because we see a highly high degree of automation in farming. And we get to sort of modern times where the truck driver is now almost the most successful and, and most um, popular job in the United States. We see software developers, but frankly, we'll be automating them as well. Retail clerks, customer service. But all in all, truck driving is actually the most um, popular in the United States from 2014 due to a census that was taken. But the trouble is we're connecting those vehicles as well. We're automating those vehicles. We're doing analysis and machine learning and artificial intelligence. And what's going to happen now is that, well, who needs a truck driver when you have something like this to actually do it all? Who needs drivers? The whole backbone of the United States and the popular jobs in the United States is now gone. You've just destroyed an entire backbone of society. And it's not unlike the coal mining situation in the United Kingdom back in the sort of 70s and 80s when I was growing up, where you had huge towns decimated um, through automation and the shutdown of the coal factories. And the same things are going to happen in call centers, where you have large um, industrial sites that have huge buildings serving 2,000 or so people sitting on an operator uh, on a phone um, taking customer service calls. And we're starting to implement AI and bots and chatbots and stuff like that. And eventually, what you're going to see is, again, huge swathes of buildings, empty buildings, because people are no longer needed. So what are we connecting here? What, what kind of society are we building where we're connecting industries and we're connecting um, vehicles and we're connecting devices and manufacturing and IoT and information? What are we building and who is it for? People? Well, if you've ever seen one of these in action, this is uh, one of these Kiva robots in China where they have entire warehouses run purely by these things. And people are actually sidelined to just place um, parcels, but essentially entire warehouse uh, runs are run by these um, these little robots, and it's actually quite fascinating to watch. If you actually YouTube um, this in terms of uh, uh, China and warehouse uh, and robot, if you put those search terms in YouTube, you'll see entire factories of these little critters running around, and it's actually it's very poetic to watch if if you stick on a bit of um, orchestral music in the background as well. It's almost symphonic. Um, but the problem is, is that we again we're connecting machines, robots, highly automated factories and warehouses, but we're actually removing the people from the equation. So who are we building this connected world for? Well, it's not them because they're not needed. Um, that particular scenario with the robots has um, 3,000 robots in one warehouse where they sort um, 20,000 parcels in an hour, and they self-charge when they actually feel themselves running out of charge they actually go off into a little corner and plug themselves in. But the thing doesn't stop. The operation doesn't stop. It's fascinating. And this is the kind of world that we are creating. But at the same time, we're removing a lot of people from the equation. Foxconn, for example, I was, um, I was actually in China um, last year uh, for the big data world. And, and I met the chairman of Foxconn. And we had a conversation about what he was doing in his factories because he's automating so much. There are huge Foxconn factories that run in the dark because they don't need to switch the lights on because it is all automated. Everything is running. All the machines are connected. All the data is analyzed in real time and processed um, with predictive maintenance. But there are no people involved. There's maybe one guy who's like the, uh, the security guard. But that's it. Um, and so people, we connect connect this world, but it's not just highly automated machines and items. You think about all the jobs that these things actually fulfill. So actuaries, for example, who are busy calculating you know, life expectancy and things like that for life insurance policies. Well, we're all sitting here with you know, uh, devices that uh, help us lead better lives, count our steps, steps analyze our health, I mean, I actually, the last time I went, I was, did a keynote in Germany, I was at uh, CBIT, and I've actually got an implant in my hand um, that allows me to connect 
to, to various things. So I can actually open locked doors. If I ever come across a locked door, I can actually fold myself in. Or if I really felt really silly, I could actually pay for my Starbucks just by waving my hand in front of a sensor. Um, but this is the kind of world that we're living in here, where our sensors uh, that we have on our bodies and that we have we carry with us with um, smartphones and um, smart watches and things like that, they're removing a lot of manual and highly what we term specialized jobs in the equation. So actuaries and accountants, think about accountancy is just number crunching. But if you're adding machinery into this, if you're analyzing data from machines, then you know that, for example, an accountant spends a lot of his time um, looking at, well, what's the future value of a machine? What's the future value of assets and things like that? Well, do you really need someone to sit down and do bookkeeping when you can actually automate that and take sensor information and, and real-time information from machines that are doing, you know, that are feeding this information in the first place? No, lawyers as well. Same thing, CEOs, Jack, Jack Ma even said that he expects to see a CEO on the cover of Time Magazine's CEO of the year by 2030. So even what we think is a, C, you know, a CEO is the top job and it will never be automated. Um, it can be automated out, out of existence almost. Underwriters, again, it's the same thing. If we're connecting more devices and connecting industries and things like that, the amount of information that's available to the machines means a lot of these, again, number crunching type jobs are becoming out you know, will be automated out of existence. Call center agents, just spoken about that. Radiologists, again, it's just pattern matching. Developers, very contentious, but developers, all you're doing is actually writing a set of structured code against, um, against rule sets. That's uh, as simple as a machine can interpret. Space exploration, again, the, there are robots on Mars well before uh, before humans will ever be there, so and futurists, well, we all know <laughs> we all need them, so we, I'm safe. But but one of the things actually, when I went up to upstairs to see the hackathon, was uh, I didn't actually realize that um, Bosch uh, include children in a hackathon, and this goes back to my point that I asked earlier about children, because. Nobody is actually asking the generation before us or the generation ahead of us, whichever one you, way you look at it, what they want us to build for the future. And when I took that question to a school, I had to sit down and think, how do I explain a connected world to a school to get the children's sense of what they want us to build? Well, how do I explain what Internet of Things is to a five-year-old child. And the best way I could come up with was imagine if your toys could talk to each other. And that, on its simplest term, is a child's understanding of what the Internet of Things is. And to get a sense, again, of, of what children want us to build, not what we think. We're very clever automating everything out of existence. We're very clever at building machines that can uh, move, move buildings almost, destroy, um, and, but this is our sense of what the connected world is. It's not what a child's sense of the connected world is. It's not what they want us to build. And so we should actually spend a lot of time talking to the generations before us and our own children to sort of say, well, what do you want me to build? This is my job, this is my profession, this is my life, but what, what are we gonna leave behind for you? So I actually asked 100 pupils at a local primary school in Edinburgh, ages five to 11, what they wanted from the, the future of the, work, of, of the workplace and what they wanted from a connected world. And some of the answers that came back were actually really quite fascinating because I expected things like, oh, I want you to build flying cars and I want you to build Jeff Goldblum in a teleporter. And I want to build, you know, and I want you to build spaceships with flares. And I want to live in a virtual world. And that's, those were, that, that was my perception of what they were going to come back with. But I actually found that their answers were far more grounded in fact and realism than some of the stuff that we actually come up today um, and actually invent. And so I got, I received um, 100 or so entries back, really detailed stuff, um, drawings, that showed their vision of the future to me. And so I sort of picked some of the best examples. And so in a connected world, the kids want 
robots to, to be commonplace, but they want them to be automated helpers. We see robots and AI as something that removes people from the equation, that makes streamlines everything so efficiently, but the children actually want us to build robots that actually help them be more productive in their job and in their future. They don't want to be removed from it. We, they, they still see themselves as being ultimately in control, but they want these guys to actually help us. So we should be building systems that have a purpose in productivity, but not to remove us from the actual process itself. So they want a connected world to be part of the process, not to be the process. And in a connected world, they don't see interfaces. It was interesting because they didn't once mention having a physical PC. And they expected everything around them to be touch, or to be spoken to, or to be an interface, rather than have something explicitly in front of them in a desk, and they'd have to sit at that desk. So if you can imagine if you're working in a factory or a warehouse, you ex actually, they expected a lot of it to be implicit. Even a robot or, or a highly industrial manufacturing machine could be an interface that they could actually speak to or work with, rather than having to carry something around with them, rather than having to go back to a desk and play with something. So everything that they expected um, that we produce from now on in a connected world, um, they could use to help them do their job. And so they wanted us to design a world that is invisible. Nothing should be explicit. And sustainability. You know, these children were actually thinking about, well, everything that we do at work has to be some kind of energy efficient device. It has to harness energy from somewhere rather than just drawing from the grid. And then it has to return that back to an energy pool as well. So even waste, office waste should actually become part of the process as a sustainable future. Smart windows, well, we could, when we talk about going backwards, when we talk about um, using um, everything as, a, as an interface, they see windows as harnessing energy as well as being a multifunctional um, utility as well. So we should be thinking about designing a connected world to be renewable, to be sustainable. Security is everywhere, actually, going back to Eugene's points in a way. But children actually are aware of the idea of privacy and security, even at the age of five years old, before they actually understand the implications of it. So we shouldn't be ignoring the, what they think and what they foresee from a security point of view. And they see things that are passive, um, passively invoked. So I'm walking, so gait analysis, for example. My voice, that's unique to me. No one else can sort of fudge that. The way I move my hands and things like that. They don't want to sit down and type in a password. We're so focused in on this security as a password thing and I have to have a PIN number and stuff like that. They don't see anything like that at all in the next 10 to 15 years when they start work. So again, design a world to be, uh, a connected world to be secure, but think about how to secure it and think about going beyond what we see as, as a mechanism for security. And in a connected world, they see the work shapes itself around them, not the other way around. They shouldn't actually have to bend to do the work. The work should actually bend around them. So if we're connecting everything and sharing that information to them, surely that information should be useful for children um, in understanding how work really works. Crowd shaping the environment. Um, they don't want to work in cubes anymore and they want to feel an emotional connection to work and surely the information that we connect and we glean from all, uh, you know, everything that we're building right now should allow that to sustain a connect, to sustain uh, an emotional connection to work. And lastly, they see people still as number one. Even video technologies that are connecting people themselves physically or, or, or virtually, they still see as a collaborative environment and we should be building a connected world that sustains a collaborative environment and, um, and keeps people at the center of the puzzle. So you design a connected world to connect people. And one of the things that we're very good at, and like I said, we, we seem to think that we know what people want us to build. 
The fact is, is that a lot of the time we're building things and connecting things just because it can be connected, not because it should be. You know, a lot of ideas we should actually be flushing down the toilet. No one wants to know what a smart pipe does because it's of no actual societal use. And kids know this already. So don't ignore children in this equation when we're building a connected world. Think about what they want us to build. This was four years ago at Christmas time. My son, who was 10 at the time, actually wanted me to help him build um, and solder a device that allowed him to program um, a, you know, a, a very rudimentary Game Boy um, on Christmas Day. Kids are naturally curious. There, there's a hackathon going up st on upstairs, which I didn't actually know about, but it's the second year running. And it just shows that kids are actually wanting to get involved, actively wanting to get involved in developing and building this connected world. And this is exactly, we should be bringing them in a lot more and a lot closer than what we are just now. And that's, if anything, out of this presentation is what the only thing that you should take away is exactly that. Bring the children closer to the process. Bring the children closer to the, des the design and the invention of the connected world. Thank you. <laughs>